All right, I need to know if this is working. I don't really want to go the whole way without knowing, and I'm not seeing anything when I try and um, go live. So does anybody see it? Ah, all right. I'm actually live this time. <laughs> One person. All right. It didn't want to work before. So, oh, that makes me feel so much better. All right. So let me introduce myself. I am uh, Cheryl Krebs. Um, my studio name is CK Pottery. Um, I am here in Fayetteville, Georgia. Um, I want to, I'm going to go through how to do Relief carving to be used for, say, uh, making um, texture plates or uh, ornaments, flat ornaments. Hi there, Corey. Hi, Stacy. Anyways, um, I want to at least give you a few examples first of some of the things that you can use this for. Um, I'm sorry about the late start. I tried getting it to go live and it would not go live for a few times. So... Anyways, um, so let's see if I can flip this camera and I'll show you a few pieces. All right, so this is a carved plate. Um, it's, I guess I, there he goes. So um, I threw the plate on the wheel and then I carved it and um, there's obviously many different layers of thickness. So you can see his nose and his hands are in the forefront and in the background is um, leaves and behind that is the um, kind of a dotted background you can see in the very back. So this one has probably five different depths, okay? What is nice to shoot for is about three depths. Um, this piece is a pretty simple one. This is about two to two and a half depths. The lines, the vertical lines are the, the furthest depth area. So to do, you know, carving on something like that, uh, that's would be the most simplest. Um, you can carve on three dimensional pieces. And, um, so like in this piece, I have the bird, I have some leaves reaching up around, um, and then of course things in the background. This one does not have any additional clay added anywhere. Um, and you can see the very, very back area has kind of a textured background. And then um, there's other pieces that are I kind of created a frame, so a little bit easier to work with a smaller area and not as much carving. Um, then the, the other things that I do is I decided since those are so time intensive, I would work towards making something that is a little more um, in a price point that people could handle. So I got to get this in my field of vision here. So this plate because I started with a, an original and then did a mold of it, I can actually make these plates um, at a price point that people can actually afford. So this one is um, at a, a $20 price point versus these, the bowls are more like $400 price point. So at least I'm able to get something that is what people can actually afford. All right, so let's start with a process. Um, my first objective is to get the clay um, carved into a um, design that I want. I have to plan it out with drawings and stuff like that, but I need certain things prepped beforehand. So this is what I call my magic box. Um, I think quite a few of you have one of these. This one is a nice one because it has the gaskets up at the top here that keep the air in there. 
I can keep my pieces uh, in working shape for carving for years. Inside the magic box, I have the plaster poured. And so inside here, I have plaster at a depth of about, oh, probably an inch and a half. And then I have these rubber shelf liner things just to keep the clay off of it. I also actually increase the uh, protection because they will kind of get salts on the back of them. So um, I think they just pick it up from the plaster. So I put little clay cookies, just cutouts that I did. And then to start, I have to have a clay uh, mold that I, that I, or a clay slab that I'm gonna carve. I keep them pretty thick. So you can see how thick this is so that as I work on it, the sides don't matter. This is gonna be my original. And, um, but that way I have a nice smooth surface to work from. So I'm gonna bring this up here. I made this one and another one using just, just cookie cutters. So I have a flour cookie cutter and I have a square cookie cutter. But you can cut it out, obviously, with a template, whatever you want. But this will be what I'll be carving on today so that you can see my process. Um, and then from there, I will show you uh, how I go about this. Sorry. It has been an absolute crazy time, I'm sure, for everybody. But on top of it, um, all right, how do I reverse this? On top of... All, everything that everybody's going through. We had a water leak and so I did not have water for the past two days and um, which is not easy when you're trying to wash your hands for 20 seconds at a time. So uh, we had to deal with that. All right so moving forward I had the, the pleasure of um, getting the approval from Jim Bridgman to use, he's a Clay Buddy member, to use his artwork for uh, one of my pieces. And I decided since he's a member of Clay Buddies, I would go ahead and use his artwork for this project. So um, anyways, I'll, I'm gonna put you in the thing now so that you can see how this works. Hopefully, I can get that to work. Let's see. You gotta put me on here so I can see stuff. Well, maybe not. All right, I may not be able to uh, see comments very easily. I can't get. Yep, nope, all right. All right, so here is the drawing by Jim Bridgman and um, or the photo by Jim Bridgman. So what I did is I took his um, photo, I drew it on a piece of paper, I edited it a little bit. So you can see the, the hands got edited a little bit because I wanted, um, I didn't want it so wide. It was gonna go on the little square piece of clay. So I, I needed it a little more condensed, I should say. And then I wanted some background, okay? So I took I took this and I shrunk it down. And I shrunk it down to this size. All right? Just using my copier. So I printed it out and I shrunk it down to this size. 
And now I'm gonna transfer this to the clay. So um, I have this stuff, transfer paper, and um, it's a it's a carbon paper, there's no wax in it, so you can uh, transfer things easily to clay, especially if it's leather hard. Um, you can use it for a lot of artwork, but it is just clay bait or uh, carbon. There's uh, or graphite, I should say. There's no um, there's no waxes, so it doesn't act as a resist. Uh, not that that really matters, but uh, for what for this purpose. But it is usable for other things as well. So, all right, I'm going to get that out of the way. Let's see if you're still. I kind of knocked you a little bit. So now I'm going to transfer this. So I take a piece of that paper and um, line it up behind this. And I'm just going to hold it onto the clay and transfer it. So I've got to just make sure I got it lined up. I got it where I want it. I'm going to have a little bit kind of coming off the edges here. I know where the top is, where the bottom is, and I'm just gonna hold it into place. And then I take just a traditional ballpoint pen and I write over the edges. So my little drawing, oh, and before I do that, so my little drawing, I added, I found another image of some clover and uh, decided I would add that to the background. So, um, I thought it would be fun to have him kind of standing in some clover. So you can see him here. He's got a little bit of clover. All right, so I line him up and I'm gonna transfer him to the surface. And um, I'm not going to get too carried away with the details on this because I just want to show the process more than the actual artwork. So, so far, let me get you a little closer. Okay. All right. So, so far, I'm just going to draw around. I'm not going to worry about the details so much yet. Um, what I do want to make sure is that I have some things that overlap because it gets, you end up with a better composition. So putting my clover here and overlapping some of the clover um, or leaves. So that my final result, I'll have planned out those kind of details. So I put a clover in front of the peanut partially here. I, um, I have one going off the page. I'm not sure if I'm going to include that one yet. Um, but I can kind of modify it as I go along. I need the peanut in here. Now I kind of messed up on his, um, over here, um, I went over the peanut 
even though it's going to be behind. So, but again, because I'm going to carve it, I have the flexibility of including that or not. All right, so let's get a little bit of his feet in here. I got a little bit of rocks. I'm going to put some of the peanut texture in. And I'm just kind of generally drawing it up here. I'm going to do the final uh, details once I actually have the, um, once I actually start carving. So it's not so critical right now. All right, so I got that transferred. You could see it's, it's kind of dark. My clay is a little softer than what I necessarily need. But that's okay, especially in the beginning. All right, so then carving. Let me get some of my carving tools here. All right, I have a variety of carving tools uh, and tools that I use. I use a little uh, brush to brush things off as I'm going. I use a tray uh, to keep, and I'll show you I have a bigger tray once I do it. Um, I keep my tools in here. I just have a little magnetized, I put a glue to magnet, I taped a magnet on and I keep my thing here in case I need to scrape a surface down or uh, get inside the grooves a little bit. Um, especially more helpful if I'm adding clay, I wanna have just a, something to scratch the surface with a little bit. Um, you know, general carving tools, smoothing tools, uh, whatever you like. But honestly, my tools that I end up using the most are the traditional Kemper carving tools. This one is one of my favorites um, because it's pointy and I can get along the edges easily. Um, these are the... Um, Oh, who made, I think this is a Kemper tool also. It's a WS, I don't know what that means. But anyways, it's it's more fine. You will go through this one faster, um, only because that little wire breaks pretty easily. Um, I will use just a traditional, I cut this one down, just a traditional needle tool, but I added a glob of um, stuff on it to keep, because as you're working, you end up just killing your finger. So I formed it with um, some of that moldable rubber stuff. And then I just use this tip for scratching surfaces. It helps to get into tighter spots. Um, this is a little hooky tool that it looks like a dental tool but sim x i e m i think it's pronounced sim use uh, make sells these um, they also make some little carving tools that are just like the kemper ones and i do like those um, but they are pricier so you know just keep that in mind the kemper ones work perfect um, i also have some of these these are made by diamond tools and I like there's three different size there's I have three different ones and because they're dual ended I have both um, I have double that and I will switch them around so um, I keep those stored with their bottoms in their protective things so that I can just drop them in their little tubes as I uh, without worrying about damaging their tips so I just keep those like that. And um, so I'm gonna store up my tools. Oh, and then I also have, these are diamond, these are diamond core tools as well. These are, I don't know what they call these things, but these are cool. And they have little rubber grippies, which is nice, especially nice for backgrounds when you're doing larger carving things. So I do have a couple of those up, a V1 and then a, a U1. So let's get the U1 in there so you can see it. 
All right, so those are my tools. I keep a paintbrush on hand um, so that I can wet things down as I'm going. I keep a squirt bottle on hand so that I can mist things if they're starting to get too dry, especially helpful for really large ones. Um, and then if your hands are starting to get sore when you're using stuff, you can just add a piece of sponge, a makeup sponge, to kind of protect your fingers because they will get beat up. These tools are so tiny and they just kill your fingers. All right, and then I have a Kemper tool that is broken, but I do end up using that one. And that one's nice to, and I, it's expendable, so if it dies, I don't care. I can always get another one. They seem to duplicate in my studio. And then of course, it's a plain old X-Acto knife to use if I need it. So I keep them on hand. I keep them in my one carving bucket. I have a larger selection of tools if I need them. I, you know, especially if you're carving something larger, I do keep those on hand. Um, I butchered a paintbrush. I use this one. I cut off the top and made it smooth. I shouldn't say smooth. Made it, I, I literally scrub with this one, okay? So this is just a Crayola paintbrush that I cut off the top and I scrub if I'm trying to smooth something out. So this is my, my junky smoother. Um, all right, so my tray. My, I, if I wanna carve, say, you know, sitting at the table, something small, I will use these little small trays. They're a little lightweight, so they tend to be a little easier to pop them up and toss clay bits everywhere, so I don't prefer that. Instead, I have this tray that I got from Ikea, and it comes with a stand, but it's metal, which is awesome. And so you can see it here. And I put a foam thing on it. I don't know why it just said that. It said I can't rotate it. I didn't rotate it. Anyways, this is what I use. I Larger pieces, I have a big one like this. I also have smaller ones. All I did was take a piece of foam and wrap it in plastic and used some stuff on the sides to um, keep it clean. And that way I'm not collecting crumbs. I can easily just kind of top them off and shake them off. So I have a smaller one though that I'm gonna pull out only because I'm using such a small tile. I'm gonna put it on here and that way I can keep my stuff on here. I'm gonna take this, get my surface ready, and I'm gonna keep my original just as a reference point. Okay, one thing I wanted to mention before I get started, if you um, have some, if you don't have as much artistic skills, but you wanna work on something like this, coloring books are great. Um, if you find things that are uh, royalty free, you don't have to worry about the, um, you know, stealing artist work kind of thing. But just to give you an idea, these are coloring pages that I have for my grandson. So um, I just thought I'd throw that out there in case you don't have any, uh, feel like you have artistic skills to be able to draw it in the first place. So you're not limited in that respect. Let me get these things out of my way now that I've shown you that stuff. I'm not normally this neat, so thank you for making me clean my studio. All right, if you don't have transfer paper, like what I had, that uh, serrated paper, there's another option, and that is to take the back of a piece of paper and take a soft pencil, either um, B, you know how they come in H and B, or I like these ebony pencils, and you can do a rubbing on the back.
and I'll show you on the back of this one. If you take a pen and draw somewhere on here, should I get out? Yeah, you'll see it'll still transfer onto the clay, so it'll still make marks. And um, so that is a nice way to do it. This clay obviously is a little softer, so I have a very um, thick line, which I don't normally have. I should have tested that as well. I kind of wet my clay down a little bit because it was a little too dry. I set it out in the sun to dry it out a little bit more, but it really wasn't that it wasn't great. All right, in this little bowl, and this I also use, especially if I'm doing a very elaborate piece. After I've gotten, I'm cutting away and I start losing my lines and I start losing some of my details, I have some food coloring in this little dish and it's all dried out. So what I do is I just squirt it inside and I can redraw lines anytime I want with a crappy paintbrush or a fine paintbrush, whatever you want to use. So if I feel like after and it's maybe not taking a pencil or um, unable to uh, finish my drawing or add to my drawing, I have used this as well. So this is another way to uh, put images on your clay for you. So I wanted to mention that. All right, so now let's get started on carving. All right. I'm going to start with the very thick ones. And the thing that I want to carve first, I'm going to draw a little bit of a line around here. I'm going to use my soft pencil. This pencil is soft enough that it will work. I'm going to just draw a little frame. And, um, you know, however you want to frame off your piece or let it go off the wall off the edge you can do that so and then in here I can just go deep and carve out I need it thicker and I can carve out deep to the background so the first area you want to carve out is the background so the deepest areas first let me see if I can get this as a better see how's that all right so I'm going to carve over here now because this tile is so thick I, I can freely go that deep on my tile And so I want to get my background as much as I can. I have to think about where I want maybe not as much depth. Around his shape. I just keep carving this little space in there right in here is a gap so I want to go inside there it's at the background but there's no uh, leaves on it don't know how to get my there's comments okay yeah I have used watercolor markers but um, I kill them I just they get so messed up so I just I just don't use them anymore I mean I have a couple but I've killed so many and the paintbrush doesn't die 
So I can use just a really fine paintbrush and use my food coloring. I also will use like crappy watercolor paints. I don't use good watercolor paints because some of them have pigment in them. And I'm just afraid if I use something that has color in it, if there's a little bit of um, pigment, it's gonna, it's gonna have some issues. So, all right, my background. I wanna go all the way around and get my background. I'm gonna pull out one that I've been working on already. So just so you can see this guy, how I started him, how I put the stuff on, and how you first go around the background. And now I wanna show you one that I've been working on that is already carved that I'm still trying to work on. So this is a water scene and I didn't do it as thick as I should have, which is not good, but so it is starting to flex a little bit um, just from pressure. So um, it is a little frustrating. So as I work on these, I carved away all the background first and uh, went through and did that. And then I went and carved all of the um, edges around all the things that are um, thicker, that have depth, and curved them into the edges. So if you look at this um, right in here, there's it goes rounded down into the wall so I can just give a little bit of depth there. So the edges have to get angled as I'm carving. Um, you can see it also with the fish. So there's a fish. Let me start it this, bend it this way. So you can see the fish is fat. And so I curved it down so I can get the depth there. Um, I don't do the detail until the end. So, and then I can also, after I make it, I can even do additional um, detail on the actual clay slab that I uh, make from the, the original. So I have not done a mold of this one yet. I'm still actually working on all the details. Um, you can see where some of my original pencil lines are still there. So as I zoom in, you can see some of the original pencil lines. And then in some locations, uh, because I was starting to, I, I don't know, you start to see double. So um, I will take paint, uh, the food coloring. And as I squirt it though, all of that tends to bleed out, which is fine, but um, I don't squirt it until after I'm done for that session. So as I'm working, I, I work on it. So a piece this size, I would, um, cover the other sides that I'm not working on with plastic so that as I'm working over here, I wanna cover this side and vice versa. And then, so each of these different locations, I'll just keep kind of going back to it and working on it, carving out little details along. So in the um, um, starfish here, you can see I gave him some depth. Now, if I feel like I need extra thickness. I can score it a little bit. So I did it with this fish. So I can score it a little bit and then I can uh, add the clay on top and just kind of press it in really tight. And I use, while I'm doing it, I use kind of a, a tool like this. This is brass and I kind of push it on really tight um, so that it's, I know that I've compressed it on the place that I've attached it really well so it doesn't pull up again. And then I can form it afterwards. So, but I just wanna add that, you know, really strong adhesion there. So anyway, so this is one that I'm still working on, but uh, it's almost done. I just got a few details like lines and texture that I wanna put in it. Now, as you use the, the, the mold from this, it will lose some of its detail. So 
Um, I'll show you one that I have done that. This is the original texture mold I made for that little plate. And as you see, he's losing some of his texture. Once he, once I made a mold of him, he lost some of his texture. Um, just purely because he's, I don't know, it pulls some of it out. I'm not sure. So anyways, so let me get that better in the, so you could see it better. Okay, so this was the original tile. And then from there, so now that I've, this one's finished, I would wanna make a mold of it. So I put it on a smooth surface, like one of these trays. I have a bunch of these trays. I might put it on the back where it's really smooth. I might put it on a piece of glass. And then I would add some clay around it, okay? So that I can make a mold. Get my little clay here. I stole my tool. All right, so here. If I'm making a mold of this one, I can take pieces of clay and put around it. And I can take another one and butt join it. I'll smooth this out and add clay to join it. So I literally am forming this around. And I would get this all the way tight. I would tighten it up all the way around the edge down at the bottom. Um, I would smooth out all the seams that I have for the pieces of clay that I've done. And then I add, depending on the size especially, I'll add these reinforcements like this so that they are going to stand up. And I hold them right next to it. And I add extra clay bits around here. So I create a wall around it. Um, it's my, this clay, by the way, once you go to plaster, you have to throw away your clay that you've used to make your mold. So I um, create the walls, I pour the plaster in, I support it all, I make sure it's all as tight as possible, I add a coil of clay down at the bottom, all the way around, so everything's as tight as it could possibly be. And then so once I'm done with that then I pour in my plaster and plaster making um, because I'm generally doing small ones I don't I'm not really worried about the the quantity of plaster that I'm using um, I'm not sure what I'm on right now right there let me put my piece back up there. Okay. So I'm not really worried about um, the making too much plaster. I keep a spare container to dump my plaster in afterwards. So I have this little spare of all my extra plaster that each time, and as I once this thing finally gets filled up, I throw it away. So I just... I, I always end up making a little bit of extra, but I want to show you my formula that I use. But how much time? 3.44. So anyways, if you want to screenshot that, this is how I calculate my plaster. And let's see. So you take the volume, the dimensions of your piece. So in the case of the little square, it would be approximately, I'd want it about two centimeters thick. 
uh, eight centimeters long by eight centimeters wide. And I would multiply that out and get a number. From there, I would calculate how much water, um, which is a, um, I actually use that amount of water on something this small. And then I calculate how much plaster and they are a 10 to seven ratio. So it is 10 grams of plaster for seven grams of water um, or 100 grams of plaster to 70 grams of water so that I can calculate how much plaster I need. Once I do that, I mix up the plaster, but we will save that for another video. If anybody wants to know how to do that, I'm happy to share my process there. All right. so. Last thing we do, how do we use this? So now I have a plaster form and I'm gonna move my other stuff out of the way here. So here's my plaster form and I'm going to zoom in a little bit so you can see it better. Let's kind of weigh it out. I don't know if I can touch this grain a little bit, get a better view of it. And I have a clay slab that I've already smoothed out and I would cut out my form so I'm going to put it on here I'm going to cut out my little template here I use a needle tool to go around the edge. And I just made this template by drawing the oval that I had originally used, folding it into quarters, and um, cutting out my edge. So I just created it on, you know, as I went. So my objective with this little plate was to make little, um, these, those little tiny plates are for like a spoon rest. I use them as my soap dishes, although it is a little large for a soap dish, but it's fun to have next to my sink. So for that. So I take this, I smooth out my edges, but I'm not going to do it yet. This is a little bit thicker than what I would use, but we'll go with it. So I can press it on top of this and I take my fingers and press it in. Make sure it's centered before I do that. And I am literally pressing it into every groove that I can find in there. So as I'm going, it is slowly going around the bird, any of the other lumps, leaves. And I just keep pressing it in. It makes it very lumpy, but I'm going to smooth that out for the most part. So I'm not worried about it right yet. I'm not going to smooth out the edges until I get um, this part done.
I don't roll it with a rolling pin only because it tends to push the clay sideways, so uh, which causes problems, I have found. So I find that it's better to just press it with my fingers, get it to where I feel comfortable that all of it has been touched. And then I take, depending on the size of the piece, I take a wooden, oh, I forgot one very important piece of information. I take a piece of fabric, I lay it on top. Don't put just the wood or it lifts it up. So I smooth the whole back out using a, I mean, you can use a hammer, I just use a rubber mallet. So the back gets smooth this way. You can use a, um, a what do you call it? A wooden, a wooden bat to do this part of it, but make sure you put fabric down first. I don't use newspaper only because I hate getting wrinkles in it. And fabric, it doesn't do that. All right. That's good enough. All right, now it's smooth, 90% smooth. And now I can smooth out my edges however I wanna smooth them out. I'm gonna save that part for another detail. But now that I have my little clay lab done, I can put it on a piece of foam and press it down, rock it a little bit. I can clean up all my edges now and you can see I actually have a little bit extra on this side than I do there. Um, so I can trim it however I want to do it. I can clean up my edges um, and then I pull out my plaster very carefully. And I end up with a little plate. And of course, you'd want to go back and clean up your edges and everything. But it really makes a sweet little plate. And a nice way to... Um, make a piece for gifts or um, smaller items. Jewelry can be done this way. Um, I'll show you also what I make from the same design is little ornaments. And these are a sweet gift. I mean, you can do just the bird. You don't even have to do it as a circle. You could just do a bird or just a butterfly or, um, you know, a favorite creature, which is a pretty, and this I fired on, or I glued on uh, ornament hangers. These are, I don't know what they're called. Um, maybe someone think of the name. Anyways, you just glue that on. Sorry, my sister's calling me. So anyways, um, I hope that was good. Does anybody have any questions? seem to get my so um, I hope you enjoyed that and I hope I gave you enough tools to figure it out oh I want to show you some other pieces so the last couple minutes I'll show you a couple pieces that I made that um, 
where I've used these texture plates just to give you some other ideas of how it can be used. Let's see, let's open it up first. Now this one broke because it was too thin. So this is a texture plate and you can see there's gargoyles in it. This gargoyle on this end is a little broken. But you can see the, the detail of the gargoyles. Uh, no, the roller does not help only because it pushes the clay to the, and it distorts your image. So it helps it. I don't use a roller only because of that. Um, there's too much, the clay is too malleable and it, and it moves around on you. So, but I want to show you, this is the whiskey sipper made from that. see his detail of this little gargoyle. Where is that? Okay, I'm not very good at that. So there's one of the gargoyles. And as I go around the piece, there's the other gargoyle. And there's his back end. So most of my stuff is Scandinavian, I don't know, European gargoyles and trolls and um, birds. I've, I, when I was young, I used to do rose mauling um, my, by a family that's from Norway. So my aunt brought me back stuff for um, rose mauling. So a lot of the swirls and car, car um, I, I like that kind of stuff. So my daughter asked me, why the heck are you making gargoyles, Mom? <laughs> and I said, it's, oh, it's kind of like carving pumpkins, you know? <laughs> so anyways, so that's one way, just a hand-built cup. Um, not too elaborate as far as the, um, the making process, but you just take your slab and your texture mold so I want to show you that texture mold that I made from that. So this is how thick I went. This is the texture mold of that. So this is the actual plaster mold that I made of it. And um, you can see I created a wall around it when I created the texture. And that allowed me some forgiveness as far as my edges. And so anyways, this one, you can see the depth of the plaster. I got a little carried away, but it's not going to break when I'm using it and working with it. So it's a pretty thick piece of plaster. I keep them just stored in cardboard boxes like this and uh, put it on the shelves. And I have it labeled what it is so that I know what I, you know, and I label it plaster so that I'm not screwing up the uh, drawing I had done of the C. This is my initial drawing of the C. And then I created a line drawing that was easy to transfer to the clay. And I still have the back of that transfer paper. And then this is my um, template that I made at the same time so that I can cut out my clay. I don't know why my, my, my words, my comments do not scroll up. So anyways, this is, um, this is how I started the drawing, then this, and you can see some of it got modified a little bit, um, but that way I have my original to go off of. Okay.
Well, I appreciate all of you being here and joining me. So, um, and I hope you make some little carvings, create some little of your own texture plates instead of having to buy them. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. And um, I can't wait to see the rest of all the presentations. So I've been enjoying them. Thank you very much. And uh, it's 401. So I will let you go. Thanks. All right. I want to save it, though, and I want to share it. So I will do both. I promise. You're welcome. You're welcome, all of you. Thank you. <laughs> I wore makeup today, so <laughs> I don't normally. Yesterday, I even had two sandals that were two different colors. So, oh, you know what I could do? Since I have a couple minutes, let me just, I'll show you my studio quick. So, let me flip this around. I don't want to be that close. All right. I have created a disaster while I was here. All right, so let me do this slowly. All right, this is my door. I have, I had a beautiful studio when I started. <laughs> I've made a mess. So uh, my this is my hand building station and uh, working station, carving station, painting station. Um, I love my um, containers. I've got a couple of them. I have a couple smaller ones. Um, my shelves up above I made. So so that I had lots of ability to uh, move pieces from one to the next, store stuff. As I move around the room, you can see my kiln in that corner. It's a one car golf cart garage. I have um, my wet box for throwing, my wheel, more shelves, tool storage, this is the stand-up station next to um, the slab roller. I'm going to move over slowly so that I don't give you get you sick. This is up here. I have my sink and my... Um, bug mill and more storage. Raku area, clay mixing station, all that kind of stuff. Uh, this I have a little sculpture cart, but I keep my tools for the wheel on here, throwing stuff, so I can wheel it out and put it next to me. Um, I put wheels on that. I got all my buckets on wheels and shelves. Very condensed, small studio. At some point in time, I will have a bigger one. <laughs> How often do you make molds and master? Um, probably, um, I mean, they take a long time to make, so I, it's a variety. I, I have probably, I don't know, maybe six or seven that I've done in the last year. So not, not a whole lot. Um, I was only originally carving on, um, pieces, you know, functional pieces, but you can see there's a bloat right there and there's a crack. Let's see if you can see the crack Maybe on the inside. I can show you the crack. So you can see where the rim cracked. It's, it puts a lot of stress on your piece. So it's a, it's a display piece now. He's a beautiful little container. Kind of made a beak to kind of go with the texture of the leaves. But anyways, it's all that work for nothing. It's a great display piece. <laughs> so anyways, I, um, I hope you enjoy. And uh, I think um, Stacy goes next. Love you all. Thank you.